Welcome to Success in Medicine. I'm Dr. Samir Desai. Are you planning to pursue a career in emergency medicine? If you are, you should know that in recent years, emergency medicine has become a more competitive specialty. Programs are receiving more applications than ever before. Applicants are applying to many more programs than ever before. Review of the NRMP data also shows this to be the case. Let's take a closer look at a few numbers. In 2016, there were a total of nearly 2,500 applicants. In 2017, this number rose to over 2,700, an increase of 227 applicants. That's the bad news. The good news is that the number of residency positions available also rose. Unfortunately, the increase in the number of residency positions available is not keeping up with the rise in the number of applicants. Because of this, we often receive emails at our website, thesuccessfulmatch.com, from medical students concerned about their chances of matching into emergency medicine. To maximize your chances of a successful match, you have to ensure that you have the right strategy in place. The right strategy is essential, no matter if you're a student at the top of your class or one ranked somewhere in the middle of your class. Per the words of Dr. David Overton, Chairman of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Western Michigan University Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine, if you're an average or even somewhat below average student, you should be able to get in if you play your cards right. Playing your cards right means going all out, applying to enough places, and getting good advice. And among those from whom you should be seeking advice are students who have been successful before you. Today, we're going to hear from an emergency medicine resident who's recently gone through this process. Brian Fromm is an emergency medicine resident at Thomas Jefferson University. In this episode of the Success in Medicine podcast, he shares with us his journey to the field, including the obstacles he faced and how he overcame them. Brian, I want to start by asking you to tell us a bit about yourself. Sure. So I was born and raised in New York. I went to college in Boston where, despite being pre-med, I also managed to become the editor-in-chief of the newspaper and play drums for an improvisational music group. The most important thing I did in college, though, was meet my wife, Sarah. I then traded the snow for the sun, and I moved to Miami for medical school. In my fourth year, I got to serve on the Medical Student Council, the Emergency Medicine Residents Association. I became the first doctor in my family, and now I'm back in the Northeast. I am currently a second-year resident in emergency medicine at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, and uh, I also get to be the uh, deputy editor for EM Resident Magazine. Well, fantastic, and congratulations to you on your emergency medicine residency and, and now being a second year. And I want to take you back to just before medical school. Yeah, you, of course, went to medical school at the University of Miami. Did you go into medical school thinking that emergency medicine was going to be the career for you? Actually, I had no idea. I entered medical school thinking I was going into neurosurgery or perhaps neurology because I was a neuroscience major in college. In fact, during my second year of medical school, I was actually a uh, one of the board members of the neurosurgery interest group. And I think in that second year, uh, a couple of things happened that, uh, that made me reconsider. One was that Sarah moved to Miami, and I started thinking more about whether the neurosurgeon's lifestyle was the, uh, was the best one for me. And uh, the other thing that happened with uh, neurosurgery was that after scrubbing into a dozen brain tumor cases, which were you know, certainly fascinating, the... I think the, uh, the novelty of it wore off, and I started thinking more about whether, uh, whether this is something that I could, uh, I could do for the rest of my life. I, you know, it's very, very narrow, and I think I started recognizing that 
I was more interested in a in a wide variety of uh, of aspects of medicine. So early on, then you were thinking perhaps maybe a career in surgery or neurosurgery. And so when did things start to shift, and when did you start to really think about emergency medicine as a career choice? The turning point for me was definitely uh, winter break, actually, of that second year of medical school. Uh, I, w- I was home uh, back in New York without any plans to do anything medical, just take some time off. And, uh, and a friend of mine who had graduated from the University of Miami and was, a, uh, was now a uh, resident in emergency medicine in New York invited me to, uh, to shadow him. Uh, I said that I hadn't had any experience in emergency medicine, but it sounded like it might be a, a cool gig. So sure, le, you know, let me, let me go for it. I, uh, I accompanied him on an overnight shift and was just blown away. I was blown away by the, uh, by the variety of the, uh, the pathology that I saw, the different types of conditions that this that this resident could just seamlessly move between, and somehow keep them all keep them all apart, and somehow take care of all them, and you know, it just seemed like he was saving lives left and right. And I think uh, uh, from where I'm sitting now, it's uh, it's especially interesting because I am uh, I'm at the same place in my training now, where you know the same point in my training now where he was when I. When I first shadowed him, um, it, at some point in the night, the uh, attending said to me, "You know, it, it's getting late. You're here voluntarily. You don't have you don't have to stay through the whole night. You're welcome to go home whenever you want." And I said, "Okay, I will stay for one more patient." And that patient happened to be in out of hospital cardiac arrest. And I got in my very first time in the emergency department, I got to uh, to witness a uh, code and really see the emergency department uh, at its best. You know, at my level in, in training at that point, I didn't understand a lot of what had happened, but I will never forget when they brought the, uh, the patient's family into the room uh, right before they terminated the resuscitative efforts. And I remember uh, them turning off the machines, everything getting eerily quiet in the room, and the uh, attending turning around to the family and just saying, I'm so sorry. And I think at that moment, uh, with that being the culmination of this uh, this really powerful shadowing experience for me, I, I said to myself, this is, I, I, I think I might be an emergency medicine resident one day. So with that just one shift that you had done in that emergency medicine department where you were shadowing your friend, you saw so much. Um, you saw the ups and downs. And would you say that at that point, that you were 100% sure about emergency medicine? Not 100%. I think I was really leaning toward it. But to be fair, I was just a second year. I had not gone on the wards at all. My, uh, you know, my breadth of experience was uh, was uh, pretty narrow at that point. So, so even though I kind of felt like I might have found my calling, I did my best to keep an open mind. And uh, and I found that as I went uh, through my third year, you know, core uh, clerkships, that I liked the, I liked everything. You know, I didn't like any one thing so much that I could see myself doing it for the rest of my career. That I could just see myself doing surgery or internal medicine or pediatrics or OBGYN. But I liked all of them. And when I did some soul searching, I realized that the aspects of each that I liked the most were the uh, were the uh, stabilization and treatment of the most acute aspects of, uh, of the illness presented in that field. And by the time my third year had ended, even though I had never actually worked a real uh, med student shift in the ED, uh, at that point I was 100% sure. I, I, knew, I knew that EM was for me. Okay, so you were at the end of your third year of medical school, and you're really thinking EM. But at that time, your med school, the University of Miami, didn't have an emergency medicine residency program. Tell us why that made things more difficult for you in terms of your path to EM. Sure. So for emergency medicine, and I think this is actually unique to EM, uh, 
they require what's called a standardized letter of evaluation, or a SLO for short. Uh, this is a kind of a standard form letter uh, evaluation that gets submitted as one of your uh, recommendation letters on your uh, residency application. And it, it really needs to come from a, uh, from a residency program, you know, with a program director, and uh, uh, in order to, to carry real weight. And so given that I was at a medical school where there was no EM residency program available, uh, that option was not open to me. So my medical school had a, uh, a waiver for this situation where any, uh, any student who was planning on applying to residency in emergency medicine could do two away rotations and uh, and if they, they did that, they could waive the home rotation. So that, uh, the thing that became difficult for me was that I, I used this waiver and I went to my away rotations having never done a single shift in my, uh, you know, kind of the friendly environment of my uh, home hospital uh, before, before going on display for, uh, for the residency programs. Now, the, this is no longer an issue because uh, the very next year, uh, the University of Miami started up a, its own residency program, so now there's no more waiver, and students at my medical school can uh, can you know, get a slow from their home program. But uh, I didn't have that luxury. Speaking of away rotations, we're at that time in the academic year where a lot of students uh, who are considering emergency medicine are thinking about away rotations. So I want to talk to you a bit about your away rotations. How many away rotations did you do in emergency medicine? And was it hard to schedule and secure these rotations? So I did two rotations uh, in order to uh, to get the appropriate number of slows in order uh, to fulfill the uh, waiver requirement for my school as well. I rotated at, uh, at Emory University in Atlanta and, uh, and at your program at uh, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Uh, and I found that I had a much harder time than I expected uh, arranging these rotations. I was told going in by, uh, by you know, people ahead of me in, in medical school that it really wasn't a difficult uh, thing to just go ahead and secure some rotations. Just, you just apply to a few, you know, take, you know, a few of them will get back to you, and you take them and you move on. It really wasn't presented to me as something that needed a lot of effort. Uh, unfortunately for me, I uh, applied to uh, 10 programs, I believe, and I didn't get any of them right away. Uh, some of them didn't get back to me at all. Some of them got back to me telling me that they were full and, you know, for the uh, times that I was uh, that I was trying to rotate. And a couple of them kind of just said, uh, well, you know, we'll let you know. Well, thanks for submitting your application. And, and I started to get nervous because this wasn't how I had heard it was supposed to happen. And I started, uh, I started panicking. I started applying to more and more programs. And I started making phone calls, sending emails. And uh, it, it became very, very stressful. And luckily, in the end, I was able to secure these two rotations. Uh, of course, the, the timing of the rotations is different for every school. So when I got these two rotations, they actually overlapped by a week or two, which uh, you know would, would would not have worked. And I needed to then call them both back and see if I could switch my July rotation to August and my August rotation to July. And somehow, somehow it worked out. Uh, but if I had known going in that I needed to be a lot more uh, proactive and apply to more programs. Uh, I think I would have had a much less awful experience doing it. Well, thanks for sharing all of that with us. That really gives students an idea of what they may be up against and will help them sort of, you know, overcome any challenges uh, during that process. I want to sure. keep talking to you a little bit more about away electives and, and ask you about any tips you may have for students who are looking to make a great impression during these rotations. Absolutely. So the the first thing to keep in mind is that the away rotation is one long interview. Every interaction you have 
with the uh, with the program director, the program coordinator, the faculty, the residents. Everything counts, and it, this contributes to the uh, to the stress and how how burnt out you're probably going to feel after doing two of them in a row, like I did, uh, because they're uh, they're judging you. They and I don't think they're uh, you know coy about that. The, this is the point of the away rotation. It's partially for you to learn. Well, you know uh, whether this is something you want to do, or whether this program is one you want to uh, want to go to for residency. But they also are deciding if you're going to be a good uh, a good fit for them as one of their residents. Uh, that even applies for the uh, for any social interaction you have outside of shifts with the uh, with the residents. I mean, it's a it's a relaxed environment. I think you know. Letting your guard down a little bit is okay, but recognize that if you do something uh, truly egregious, you, the residents will will go back to their uh, to their program director and say, "This is not somebody I want at my, uh, you know, at our residency." And, and the converse is true too. If you if you're an absolute all star, the residents will vouch for you. Uh, other things that are important is recognizing going in that the uh, that. The emergency medicine mindset is different than, uh, than everything else you've been doing in medicine before this. If a patient comes in with a burning chest pain that woke them from sleep, your job is not to diagnose them with acid reflux, but rather to decide that it's not an MI. You know, we're, we're not in the business of, of making diagnoses, as weird as that sounds. We're in the business of, of ruling out badness. So keeping that in mind as you're going through your rotation, I think will will make you a uh, a, a stronger med student. The, the last thing I'll say about this is keeping in mind the uh, what's called the 2 a.m. test. Uh, I, I don't know if this is a concept in other, in other specialties, but it's uh, it, it, it'll definitely get mentioned at some point in the uh, emergency medicine uh, rotation and application process. And this is a, the uh, the question is. As a attending or a resident, are you somebody who I would want to be alone with on my shift at 2 a.m.? And, and that and that goes for in two different uh, two different ways. One is if it's an absolutely crazy shift, you know everything's hitting the fan, and and I need. I need a resident working with me who is an all-star and who I can trust and who I know will be good under stress and take care of the patients. Do you, do you meet that? The, uh, the other aspect of that is, let's say it's 2 a.m. and the department is dead. There is nothing going on. It's the two of you sitting at a desk, twiddling your thumbs, and you know I have nobody to talk to but you. Are you an interesting person? Are you a cool person? Are you somebody who I would want to hang out with? And I think that's the, the two parts of the 2 a.m. test. So keeping all of that in mind, I think, will, will uh, benefit students who are working on their, uh, on their away rotations. Brian, you mentioned uh, the stress associated with rotating through emergency medicine, especially when you want to make that your career. And I want to talk about medical students who are completing these away electives because one of the sources of stress has to do with not knowing how you're being perceived by the attendings and residents you're working with. And so I want to talk a bit about feedback during your emergency medicine rotations. Would you say that you received regular feedback during your away electives? Yes and no. Uh, as the medical student, I mostly worked closely with residents, uh, which is good, but I didn't get as much face time with attendings as I had hoped. And and not a lot of physicians get training in how to deliver uh, great feedback and useful feedback. So a lot of the time at the end of the shift, it would just be, oh, great work, Brian. And, I, and I'd go home not knowing if that was a pleasantry or if they really thought I you know, did a stellar job that shift. Uh, that said, I, uh, each of the two rotations I did, I had some interaction with attendings who did give me worthwhile feedback. And at each program, 
there was one faculty member in particular who I worked multiple shifts with and who was able to, you know, identify strengths and weaknesses and actually uh, actually give me good feedback as I went so I could track my progress. But that was, that was not true of every shift and that was not true of every attending. So yes and no. When you think back to the residency application and selection process, did you have any concerns about matching? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I I would love to think that I'm the you know the best applicant to emergency medicine ever, but in in reality, I knew that on paper I was an average applicant. I had done a lot of reading about uh, about you know, the average numbers. You know what score you have to get to be this likely to match, and I and you know what the average step scores are for uh, for emergency medicine, matched applicants, unmatched applicants, and I realized that my step scores were average, my grades were average. I did some interesting things, but nothing more interesting than what anyone else was doing, and that made me nervous because I knew I was applying to a very competitive specialty. So. Uh, so I applied very broadly, uh, and what made my situation a little bit more challenging was that uh, was that my wife was also applying to graduate school at the same time, and I wanted to make sure that I was not just making good decisions for myself, but for her too. Uh, I needed to take her career into account, which obviously is very important, but of course, but you know, from my own perspective, it made the process uh, that much more uh, more difficult because I. I needed to also make sure I matched in a place where I could uh, promote uh, her career. So I applied all over the country. I applied I applied to 10 programs on the West Coast, which was, I, I now realize, a, a mistake because I have lived on the East Coast my entire life. I've, I've been to the West Coast all at one time. And... The, the program saw right through my application, and they knew that I had no connection there, and that I wasn't going to actually go there if I, you know, I, w I wasn't going to rank a West Coast program highly. And, and and they were right; I wouldn't have. And so the result was I got zero West Coast interview invitations out of out of those ten. So <laughs> that that made things a little bit more concerning. Because at the time, I think I didn't realize that uh, I didn't realize why I wasn't getting those interviews. Uh, as time went on, I I did ultimately meet my goal, which was to get uh, to get 12 interviews. I had read some research that uh, at least as of you know, a few years ago, uh, 12 interviews in emergency medicine would make you 99% likely to match, and I got exactly 12. So, and. Most of them were uh, were interviews that, at programs that I really liked and would have been happy going to. So by the end of the process, I was definitely feeling a lot better about everything. After applying to emergency medicine residency, it's always hard for applicants to play the waiting game, wondering if and when they will receive interviews. You were very proactive after you applied with respect to your networking efforts. Can you tell us what you did and how that helped you get interviews? Sure. This is a topic that I don't think is discussed enough in the uh, in the medical schools. Uh, networking almost feels like uh, like a, like a shady process. Like it shouldn't be part of this very formalized, you know. Uh, uh, application process through the match it, it it feels like I submit my step scores I submit my uh, my grades I submit my personal statement and my letters of recommendation and based on that I should uh, I should get interviews and based on how I do in the interviews I should you know get ranked a certain way but the reality is most applicants or a large number of applicants would be would be very good residents. They made it this far into uh, into medical school, so they must be doing something right. And when a program is faced with this many applications by applicants who would be good for their program, it becomes difficult to uh, to differentiate, you know, and to decide, you know, who to act who to extend invitations to and who to rank at what uh, at what point. So. Uh, uh, 
as the process drew on for me and I wasn't getting the number of uh, interviews that I had hoped for, I started sending out uh, I started sending out emails with uh, updates about you know new things I had done a re- you know a research publication that I had gotten uh, you know an award I won just to to let people know that I'm still doing uh, good things and and that had moderate success. I think what really started getting me those last couple of interviews was uh, was reaching out to people I knew at the programs or at least at the institutions and it and. At this point now, in hindsight, it's obvious that I should have done that right off the bat. But like I said, I it it felt it, it felt like sh- like a shady dealing almost. But like for for example, I reached I reached out to uh, a fellow I knew at one of the uh, at one of the programs who happened to be my advisor on the uh, Emra Med Student Council that I I mentioned I was a uh, member of. So he knew me, we had worked together, he knew I did good work. So when I reached out to him and said, hey, I haven't gotten an interview, you know, I haven't heard back from uh, from your program yet, he said, hey, let me see what I could do. And a very short time later, I got an interview invitation. And and that's not, that's not, you know, doing anything wrong. That's just, you know, making sure that the, uh, that the program knows that you're someone who's serious about their program and that there's faculty there that there's somebody there who they already trust who's willing to vouch for you and that I think holds a lot of weight for uh, for the programs many emergency medicine residency programs arrange for applicants to attend a pre-interview social event where they can interact with residents can you tell our listeners about what these events are like yeah, they're they're really not very scary events. They're just social gatherings, and they shouldn't be played up in anyone's head as much more than that. But understanding that it is still part of the interview, and if and if you you know and if you get wasted and start dancing on tables, you're probably going to get ranked lower than someone who doesn't do that. Um, but as long as as long as you're a normal human being and, 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 you know, play nice with the other residents and it shouldn't, it shouldn't affect your, uh, your standing one way or the other. What it is good for is just getting to know the, uh, the residents, uh, getting to learn a little bit more about the, uh, the program and who's part of it in an informal setting. Um, and most of them were just, you know, at, uh, at bars or restaurants, a couple of them that I went to were at, uh, were at, residents' homes, and, and it was mostly just, you know, chatting and, and being friendly. I did have one that was at a, uh, at a bowling alley, and this really came to, to illustrate how neurotic medical students who are, uh, who are in the midst of the application process can get. And I, I think a lot of people can relate to this, uh, to this mindset, where we're we're bowling and and you know the alleys are uh, you know some of the applicants some of the residents we're all bowling together and I find myself thinking how well should I bowl should I should I bowl better than the residents if I do am I going to look like an all star or will I come off looking you know looking looking bad like are they going to get mad that I'm doing better than them the reality is that this that I had the opposite problem I'm an awful bowler. And uh, and my concern was I'm throwing the the ball into the gutter and and uh, I'm wondering if this is going to affect my uh, my standing if they're going to say this guy's an awful bowler he has no place in our program where the person uh, next to me the you know this woman who's like oh I I've never bowled before and is throwing strike after strike I felt like she had a uh, a leg up on me in the uh, in the application process in in reality I'm sure it didn't matter one way or the other but this is just I think a, a look into the neuroticism that some uh, that probably everyone going through the application process and on the interview trail will start to feel for every little interaction. Well, that's a great story. How's your bowling game now? It is no better. It it it, it remains really really bad. <laughs> I, I have other strengths. I promise. So let me move on now to interviews. I know that a lot of our listeners 
are wondering what interviews are like in emergency medicine. Can you tell us about your experiences interviewing? Um, yeah, so emergency medicine is, I think, very laid back in how they interview. And I went to multiple places that that reassured us beforehand that they weren't going to be, you know, uh, that they weren't going to be very confrontational. That it was mostly going to be conversational, and and that is that was actually my experience. That it was a lot of just you know, sitting down, uh, you know, at somebody's desk and chit chatting and then working on getting to know you. And if you made it to, to the interview table, it's because they already think you would be, you know, an excellent resident. You already were good enough on paper that they extended you the interview. And now the goal is just to, uh, for them to get to know you. So going into the interviews, I made sure to do my research before, uh, beforehand. I read up on the programs. I really, I went through the program's website with a fine tooth comb, wrote, you know, wrote down things that I liked about each program, wrote down things I had questions about. And, and I, uh, and I just showed up and sat down and had conversations and got to bring some of those up and demonstrate that I had uh, done my research, but also was able to ask questions that were, uh, that were one directed you know, in program specific, and two, not just something that I could look up on the website. Uh, but I never had a, uh, I never had, you know, a um, uh, mini multiple interview setting. I never had to, you know, do a group project during the interview day. No one slapped an EKG down in front of me and, you know, and asked me where the, you know, where the uh, conduction delay was. It was, uh, it was really very, uh, very laid back. It seemed like at some programs there was no agenda at all. And I found that, you know, uh, each interviewer kind of was independently getting to know me. Uh, and at other programs, it seemed like each, uh, each interviewer was assigned a, uh, kind of an aspect of me to learn about. And, and that was that was good because nobody overlapped questions, but you know, at every single program, you know, I got asked the obvious questions like, you know, why do you want to go into emergency medicine and why do you want to go to our program? So you know, you should just anticipate those. I did have one interviewer who told me right off the bat that they had not read my application, and they said, just you know, give me a second, and they pulled out my application, and they started leafing through it, and they stopped on neurosurgery interest group, you know, a uh, board member, and just looked up and said, neurosurgery interest group, uh, what's up with that? And, the, and, the, and that was my interview question, but I really didn't have, I, I really never felt like I was uh, getting grilled, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And um, I want to ask you about some of the more difficult questions you encountered during your interviews? Yeah, the, there were a few off the wall questions. Luckily, there really weren't a lot of difficult questions. You know, and, uh, probably the, the most difficult actual question I got was, you know, were, were things about weaknesses in my application. Uh, but if you, you know, you should go into a uh, you should go into an interview recognizing what the weaknesses in your application are and be ready to uh, to explain them. I, you know, some of the some of the weird questions I got. You know, some uh, one interview one interviewer asked me about my you know favorite childhood toy, which I you know believe it or not had not uh, prepared an answer for. Um, and I'm sure if I thought about it now, I could come up with something really clever, but. I kind of just, uh, you know, said the first thing that came to my mind. I said, uh, as a child, I, you know, I like playing with Legos. And I guess I didn't blow it because the interviewer said, oh, a lot of people give that answer. So, okay. I, you know, at least I, you know, at least my answer wasn't totally off the wall. But, you know, I, I somehow managed to follow it up with something about being really, uh, really creative and innovative and all that. So I, I think I was able to play it to my strength. Uh, one, one, Interviewer. It was actually a program director. One of the uh, one of the places I interviewed. 
Uh, I walk into his office and there was like a tiny sandbox, I guess, sitting on his desk. And he invited, he invites me to sit down at his desk. And I, to this day, I have no idea if he placed it there for the sake of the interview or if that's just something that sits on his desk all the time. But we spent the first five minutes of the, uh, of the interview kind of digging with our hands through this little sandbox and molding things into, you know, molding the sand into different shapes and, and just kind of having a casual conversation about this sand. And I don't, I don't know what, what the purpose of that was. I don't know if I, uh, you know, if I passed the test or not, but, uh, I'm hoping that the goal was just to demonstrate that, you know, that I'm a normal person who can have a conversation about, about random things and not only talk about medicine. Uh, I think the, probably the weirdest experience I had in an interview was, uh, I walked into one, of uh, so, uh, I'm a, uh, I'm a religious Jew and I wear a uh, yarmulke on my head. I wear a, a, a Jewish skull cap and, I walked into one of my uh, program director interviews and the program director walks in and he too is wearing a yarmulke. And, uh, and he said, Oh, I didn't know that we would have somebody, uh, you know, somebody wearing a yarmulke at our interview day today. And uh, emergency medicine be damned. We spent the entire interview just talk, talking about Judaism, which was not something I, uh, I expected to come up on my interview. I did I, I figured I should know some emergency medicine and medical jargon, but I definitely did not expect that I'd be going deep into the weeds using, you know, using kind of, you know, uh, Jewish jargon on my uh, on my interview. But uh, but there you go. You kind of never know what you're going to expect. Uh, you never know what you're going to get on, on these interviews. Well, Brian, thanks so much for this very eye opening look into the whole emergency medicine application and residency selection process. I want to end by just asking you for any final thoughts or recommendations for students interested in EM. Yeah, so as a medical student uh, rotating through the emergency department, you may feel like you're just an extra person there. You know, of course, you're there for your education, but you may not feel like you're doing any patient care because the resident and the attending are taking their own histories and may not always get to include you in making the plan. And that can get very frustrating. I remember being there. But... Keep in mind that you have the ability right now as a medical student to help patients, whether it's arranging follow-up, uh, explaining what that positive lab test actually means, getting someone a blanket and a sandwich, or even just sitting and chatting with a scared and lonely patient will make the worst day of somebody's life a little bit better. Uh, it, it may not get you a better grade. People may not see you even doing it, but you know, it'll, it'll definitely make you a better doctor. That is fantastic advice, and uh, this whole episode has been wonderful, and I thank you so much for giving us a window into this whole process. I think there's a lot that our listeners can take away from this episode, and uh, thank you so much, Brian. You're very welcome, and, and thank you so much, Dr. Desai, for including me in your podcast. Absolutely, and I hope that uh, we can do this again sometime down the road. Sure. Take care, Brian, and best of luck uh, with residency. Thank you so much. For more information about how to match successfully into emergency medicine, please visit our website, thesuccessfulmatch.com, where you can access our blog posts and other podcasts, as well as visit our emergency medicine specialty page. If you are enjoying the content of our Success in Medicine podcast, I do encourage you to take a few minutes of your time to rate and review us at iTunes. We would really appreciate it. Until next time, I'm Dr. Samir Desai.